the announcement's already been made, <laughs> but I'll make it from up here. So good to see kids in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Anybody else want to try that? Some of us would never get up if we did that, right? Never again. Well, it's good to see you once again this morning. We are going to turn to Luke chapter 10. If you would open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, I'm going to be preaching from what is a really familiar passage of Scripture, the Good Samaritan, this morning, and hopefully bring out some points you haven't heard before about that story. Like I say, it's, it's such a famous story that we've gotten to the point where when someone goods, does a good deed out of the blue, often we say they are a Good Samaritan, right? So that's something that has kind of taken hold in our, in our culture. And it's one of the neatest stories in the scripture because it, there's so much to it. There's a lot going on with the, the history involved here. But what I'm going to do this morning using this passage is I want to show you three different people or three different attitudes toward life. You know, we've been talking about living in, the, in that more than realm and the excellence of God. And in this world, of course, there are many people who are takers, and there are lots of keepers, and there are some givers too. So I'll explain what each of those are as we go through the story, and hopefully you can see a little bit of yourself in here. You know, we can take our, our spiritual temperature, so to speak, and see where we fall in this spectrum. So we'll be in Luke chapter 10 in verse 25. Now, of course, to, to set the stage here, the, 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 the lawyer in this passage was one of the, the Pharisees. You know, this would have been somebody who really knew the Scriptures inside and out. They, they know the law. And these guys always tried to fool or trick Jesus. They always wanted to, to ask him a question he couldn't answer and, and put him into a corner and make him look foolish. And that's exactly what happened here is you have a person who's probably trying to uh, justify their own bad attitude a little bit. And so they're seeing what Jesus has to say on this subject, okay? So in verse 25, it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. And here was the question. He said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus, I love how he'd do this. He'd turn it back on him, right? The guy's trying to, trying to get him, and he said, he said to him, what is written in the law? What's your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus' reply, he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, meaning the lawyer, wanting to justify himself. See, a lot of people come to God's word wanting just to, you know, c confirm their own bad habits or find justification for a, a bad attitude and, and, and want to twist God's word. And it says he wanted to justify himself. And he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right, so Jesus tells this very, very famous story as an illustration of who we should regard as, as our neighbor that we're supposed to be loving. You know, because really that's the two great commandments, isn't it? To love your God with everything you have and then to love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you'll live if you do those things, but who's my neighbor? All right, let's take a look. Verse 30. Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he, he took out two denarii, he took out some, some money, and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? 
And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. That's a beautiful story, isn't it? But there's some ugliness in it too. We're going we're to deal with the ugly this morning and then we'll get to the good news, okay? But we need to have a word of prayer once again and ask the Lord to help us understand what he wants us to see today. Would you bow with me? Father, just now as, as we come together with the, the word open before us, Lord, we want to recognize that you are wanting to speak in some way to our hearts today. Each of us as individuals, this message may strike us differently, but we know, Lord, that's you dealing with us through your living word. We, we just want to pray, Father, that we would not resist you because how can the clay resist the potter's hand? We want to be molded into what you would shape us into, Father. So we want to yield. We want to very humbly admit, Father, that we need further teaching on this subject of loving our neighbor as ourself. Help us to live in a more excellent way than some do, Father, in, in this story and in our everyday life. And we love you so much. We thank you for Jesus, for his wisdom, for his sacrifice for us, for his unending love. And it's in his name we ask these things. Amen. And some folks do want to take this verse and twist it and say, well, well really, is, is, is everybody my neighbor? I've actually heard very, very false teaching on this subject before. I actually, I actually heard a teacher one time teaching a Sunday school class who said that, that your neighbor, well, that, that's good Christian folks who are in your church with you, but you, you don't have to do good for and I thought, how twisted. But the person who was doing that teaching was doing just like this lawyer here. He says, well, who is my neighbor, Lord? Who do I have to do good things for? Who am I expected to have compassion on and show mercy to? And I think it's pretty clear right here, isn't it, that Jesus wants us to reach across maybe all kinds of different lines to show his mercy and love to the people who are around us, Christian or no. Christian or no. And, and there were a lot, of, a lot of barriers here. Many of you may realize that the Samaritans and the Jews, there was a, there was a racist problem between these two, two groups. And they, they did not like one another. So for this Samaritan to come help this Jewish man on the side of the road was really an act that went above and beyond what the culture would have told him to do. I mean, I mean it, was a, it was a pretty big, pretty big move to go over there and do this. So there's many different aspects to this, but I wanted to talk to you about the people he encounters. And the first group are takers. You know, he, the road to Jericho was a very, very long, treacherous road, and it was known for being populated with bandits. So you, you likely were going to get robbed if you went down that Jericho road because it was isolated. Nobody could help you. If they caught you out there alone, they, they'd rob you, and, and sure, they, they, this man's just walking down the road, and they grab him, and they beat him, and they take everything he's got, and it says they left him laying there half dead. And some people in this world are, of course, takers. They're out to see what they can get. And the philosophy of a taker, a person who only is out for themselves, their philosophy is, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. What's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. And my father raised me that there's, there's very few lower acts in this world than thievery. That to steal is such a rotten thing to do. You know, it's, it's no wonder that it's right there in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. Because isn't it disgraceful when somebody else went out and gave their time and their effort and their energy and their money to get something honestly, and then someone steals it from them? And I'm from an area of the world where there's a lot of theft because there's a lot of drugs. You know, a lot of people get hooked on methamphetamine and various other things, and they'll saw the catalytic converter off your car. Steal the copper out of your air conditioner. You know, I mean, they're, they're, thieves are just running wild. But one thing about it, you've got to understand that a person who only lives for themselves, who only lives to take, who are only out to see what they can get, they're, they're in bad, bad company. Because stealing is satanic. Now think about it. Jesus said that the devil is a thief and that he comes to steal and kill and destroy. 
So if you steal something, you are actually acting like the devil. It goes a little further than the way most people think about it, right? And, and I, maybe you didn't break in anybody's, in, in anybody's house and steal their belongings, but, you know, it, it'd be the same difference if you went to the grocery store and just kind of forgot to ring up a couple of things. Or, you know, there's all kinds of ways to be dishonest. And that's how some people do. They're only out to say, okay, what's yours is mine, and I am going to take it. And clearly, that's not the sort of person that we want to be. Amen? Amen. Let's never ever fall into that. Don't, don't steal. Don't be a dishonest person. Don't go down that road. And so that's what they did is they said, well, this man has some possessions. We're going we're gonna to beat him and we're going we're gonna to take that for ourselves. Now, the poor guy's laying there half dead on the road. We don't know how long he had been there. But lucky him, help arrives, right? A couple of fellow Jews come down the road and one is a priest and the other one is a Levite, basically a musician for the temple. So you got the preacher and the song leader come by, brother. And, and, and what was their reaction? I mean, it, it, it's, it's hideous when you think about it. Because it took a Samaritan coming by who really by, any, by anybody's estimation should have just hated that man and said, well, I'm glad he's laying there dead. But here came by a couple of people who are supposed to be holy. A priest and a singer come down this road and upon seeing this poor guy half dead in the ditch, what does it say they did? They went to the other side of the road. They, did, they didn't just walk right by the guy and say, sorry about your luck. They said, ooh, I'm not getting involved. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to walk down the other side of the street because, you know, maybe they felt like they were in a hurry. I, I'm, I'm doing Jerusalem. I don't have time to stop and help this guy. Or maybe, maybe they'd done a few good things that day. I don't know. And they said, well, I've done my part. Somebody else can help that guy. But do you see how disgraceful it is to say, I'm a person of God, and then avoid someone in dire need like that? It's awful. And these two guys, this priest and this Levite who came by, they're what we're going to call keepers. And, and, you know, the thief's philosophy is what's yours is mine, and I'll take it. Well, the, the keeper, that, that sort of person's philosophy is what's mine is mine, and I'm going to hold on to it. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to hold on to it. Helping that guy may cost me something. It's going to cost me effort and time. And look, he's all bloody. This is going to be messy. This is going to cost me some money putting him up. I, somebody else will come along who's rich or stronger than me or has medicine. And, and I'm not going to get involved. In it. And if you're a keeper, then you're living in that area of life where you're so worried about losing that you're not following God like you ought to be. Just trying to hold the line. Now, I'll tell you what. When Carrie and I first got married, we were broke. Big time broke. Can you relate? When you're wondering how you're going to keep the lights on. And if you live that way for a while, I know what it is to, you know, to have a poverty mindset. You're so anxious to claw out of that hole that when you finally get something, your tendency may be to... To love it a little too much. You say, I, I, I've, I finally got to where I can live comfortably. Now I'm going to hold on to this stuff. And it can make you stingy. It can make you stingy. Don't, al always be careful. Don't let your circumstances turn you into a stingy person. A person who only knows how to keep it's, it's, it's what I have, what I possess, what I've got, security. I'm gonna, now, there's nothing wrong with having things. There's nothing wrong with having financial security. There's nothing wrong with being in a hurry and trying to get somewhere. I'm not putting, I don't know these guys' situation, but it's clear what God would have us do, right? These, these guys just said, I, I'm, I'm not getting involved. Now, I hate to tell you, you know, I called a thief satanic a minute ago, but the keeper's in a bad spot too. If, if you're a person who's incapable of giving, then you're missing out on one of the biggest blessings of being a Christian. You're just holding the line, holding on to stuff. 
And when you're able to bless other people, it's a huge blessing on you. See, you think your blessings are all the stuff you're, you're holding on to, but don't let that turn you into a person who is incapable of compassion. Because I promise you, somebody's got it worse than you. Right? And you could help them somehow. I mean, as broke as I ever was, I had a dollar to give somebody. I, I could have skipped a meal and gave my cheeseburger away. You see what I'm saying? But, but man, it didn't feel that way at the time. It felt like if I give, if I give even a dollar, I'm going to die. Just how big is your God anyway? See, that's the sad part about this, is this priest and this Levite who claim to be servants of God should have realized, my God is not stingy. My God is not poor. My God is rich. And he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. And if I don't give ever to anybody or to my church or help anybody out, it demonstrates a lack of faith. Is God real to you or not? Is, is God big enough to supply and meet needs like He promised you? It, or has your faith withered up as you've been struggling along? You've got to let that faith out of the box and say, all right, I, I, I feel like God is leading me to help this person out, but it does not make sense. I'm going to have to trust God. I'm going to have to have faith because I know He would want me to have mercy and have compassion on others, not go to the other side of the road and say, I'm not going to get involved. Folks, we're not supposed to be sideline Christians just sitting over here watching the game. Get on the field and play some ball here. That's what God has called us to do. Whew. Sorry if I'm on your toes, but I'm going to tap dance on them this morning. Because it's, 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 it's a poor representation of the Lord when we're stingy. You know, some great advice that was given to me as a pastor early on, it, it, a good pastor friend of mine said, Marcus, don't ever make God look cheap. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, don't be the preacher who comes in and eats a steak dinner in a restaurant and doesn't tip the waitress. Don't be that person who makes God look cheap. Don't, don't walk in and say, can I have my pastor's discount? Come on. Is God broke? No. Then why, sometimes the way we act makes it seem like he is. Or at least we think that way. Or we'd be a little more generous with our time. And I know some of you are thinking I'm talking only about money. I'm not. Money is a great thing to be able to give and possessions and stuff. But how about your time? As broke as you are, you can give your time and your talent to the church and to other, other people. That's something you can always give. Amen. So are you a taker? I don't know. I, I don't think so. I'm not looking around this morning thinking, boy, we've got some thieves in this church. No, I, I know a lot of you are, are, are not that. But you just may be a keeper, and that's worrisome too. Take the lid off and let God show you just how much of a blesser he is able to be. Then finally, we come to the Samaritan. And of course, that is, the, that is the giver in this story. And, you know, people who really know how to give are just a tremendous blessing. Has, has anybody ever helped you out in a way that you, you, just, you were just astonished they, they went above and beyond the call, and I bet you, you can think of their name and their face to this day, because you'll never forget. You'll never forget who really helped you out, especially if it cost them something. Mm -mm -mm. See, the thief, the taker, their philosophy is, what's yours is mine, and I will take it from you. The philosophy of the keeper is, what's mine is mine, and I will hold on to it. But the philosophy of a giver is, what's mine is yours, and I'll share it with you. And again, that could look like a lot of different things. Hospitality is very, very important 
for Christians to practice. Did you know that? The scripture tells us that some people by being hospitable have entertained angels unaware. Invite somebody over for dinner, you know. <laughs> you know, bring, bring somebody in to your home and, and, and allowing them to have some time with you and allowing them to, to be at your table and, and, and being a blessing to others. I, I think in this world we've all gotten very suspicious <laughs> and walled off from people. And some people are suspicious, and you, you should feel that way. But for the most part, it's caused us to kind of mute our hospitality a little bit. And I think we need to pick that back up. Because if that's going extinct in the world, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for God's people to practice? They say, man, everybody else is just in their bunker, just trying not to have any contact with anybody. But there's a Christian who had me over for supper the other night, and it was just a great time. Just a great time. Something as simple as that. And when you begin to give, that's when you really look like your Lord. I told you a while ago that to be a thief and to steal is to be like Satan. Guess who you're being like when you are a giver? You're being just like our precious Lord Jesus who had heaven, who was on the throne of the universe in splendor and did not have to do what he did for us. But he left heaven and traded it in to come down here and play in the mud with us, to live in human flesh, and then to be nailed to a cross for our sins. Thank you, Jesus. And, and that is the ultimate example of what it is to be a giver. He literally gave everything he had. Can I not then, in his example, turn around and give something to somebody? I mean, I don't have a gift that I can give the whole world. And, and I don't have the opportunity to, to, to die for anybody. But in his example, in his great love... Can I not then turn around and give just a little bit? Just a little bit more than I used to? That's the message this morning. See, remember, Jesus will go all the way back to the first part of the sermon series on, on the excellence of God. Jesus said, didn't he? Life is more than what you will eat next. Life is more than the clothing that you wear. Don't worry about such things, but instead, instead, seek God, and the Lord will take care of those things in your life. See, to live in excellence is to be a giver. And God loves, the scripture says, a cheerful giver. Who was, who was his neighbor? Well, Jesus said in verse 37, or the, the, excuse me, the lawyer said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus told him to go and do likewise. So that's going to be the message for us this morning too. Go and do likewise. Don't just say what that Samaritan did is, is really, really cool. And, and wow, what a deal. Go and do likewise. Become a giver if you're not. And if you're holding on, or you've been taking more, then it's time for a change. It's time for a shift in your heart. Roger, let's close with a song. There is dead silence in this place this morning. And I thank you for your kind attention. I, I, know, I know you're listening, and I know you're evaluating where we find ourselves in this passage. That's a wonderful thing to see. 433 will be our final hymn. If you would turn there in your hymnals, good old I surrender all. And before we sing it, we're going to spend some time here in prayer. Would you join me? Father, the last thing we want to be is a taker. But we also don't just want to be a keeper who is stingy and holds on to things. Father, we want to repent of all the times when we could have helped and we went to the other side of the road, when we, could have, when we could have encouraged, when we could have blessed, and we didn't do it out of fear, 
out of self-preservation. Father, move us out of that, I pray, into the realm of being a giver. Because we can't outgive you, Father, and we know that all the riches of, of heaven and earth are at your disposal. And we need to have more faith in you, Lord. It's just a lack of faith when we do not give of our talents, our money, our time, our effort. Father, we want to uh, press on into more. So I pray just now if we look in our own hearts and we see that we're takers or keepers, that instead we would just drop that right now and say, Lord, would you reveal to me who I ought to have mercy on today? Who, who around me is suffering and needs something that I could give? And then, Father, give me the, 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 the spirit and the, the, the courage and the joy to be able to give to others as the Samaritan did. There's a lot in this story, Father, but what we see is ourselves. We see the ugliness of thievery. We see the ugliness of, of ignoring. Father, we never want to be like a, a religious person with our nose up in the air when people around us are lying half dead in a ditch. And Father, I pray for anybody who's here today and, and says, well, Pastor, this all makes sense, but I, I know that there's something inside of me that needs to change, and I've never made Jesus the Lord of my life. And if that's what you want very much in your heart today, the Scripture says you can come to Jesus and He'll save your soul. It doesn't cost anything. You can't earn it. It's a free gift that Jesus is able to give. And if you're ready to receive salvation and be a Christian today, in just a few moments as we sing, I'm going to invite you to come to the front of the church. Meet me here and we're going to pray. And I'll introduce you to the King of Kings. Father, I pray that you will have your own way in this house. We don't want to grieve you, quench you uh, in any way. And Lord, I just, uh, I just worship you today for saving my soul and for what you're doing in our church. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's stand together for hymn number 433. If you're ready to receive Jesus, you come. In Jesus' name. Let's sing. since she moved here and she has made the decision to come and, and join us here at Grandview. Right. And so we're gaining a member today, sir. Amen. Amen. Anything you want to say to the congregation? No question. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, really enjoyed it since I moved here from Oregon and bringing my grandchildren here. And I do believe that the Lord brought me here because it's very hard to find a church that, that you truly love and I truly do love this church. Amen. And your church loves you. Thank you. Bless you. Amen. Amen. 
we love to see that growth. And if anybody else has been contemplating becoming a member of Grandview, it's one thing to attend, it's another to be a member because when you become a member, of course, you get to vote on things at the business meeting and serve on uh, committees and in ministry. So it is important that if anybody's been thinking about making that move or wants more information on it, your first stop is simply to come see me. I just want to hear about your spiritual history and, and what churches you've been to and uh, figure out where you need to go next and uh, we'll get you plugged in, okay? God bless you all. Let's go to our announcements. OCC 